right, well, most of you already know me, but I'll go through the usual <laughs> procedure, which is to introduce myself before I can introduce our next speaker. I'm Matthew uh, Doyle. I'm the acting director of the Monash European and East Centre. And it is my great pleasure to introduce somebody who's been a really good friend of the centre, His Excellency Andrzej Roszynski, who is ambassador of Poland to Australia. His Excellency uh, Andrzej Jaroszynski has been ambassador to Australia since 2008 and very shortly, if I remember correctly, after his arrival in Australia, we, had, had, we collaborated in organizing an event in the city which was actually uh, for uh, um, uh, very sad reasons because it was an event in the city which was uh, designed to mark uh, that tremendous event for, for the Polish people, which was the loss of the leading figures of the government in this uh, tragic plane accident uh, which took place um, when uh, a plane carrying uh, government leaders towards Katyn for commemorative uh, celebrations uh, actually crashed in Smolensk. And we organized a very, very uh, somber but uh, significant, I think, event at that time. But uh, the uh, ambassador has come back on a number of other occasions to the center, and he's back with us today to talk on an area of expertise for him, which is the common security and defense policy in the EU neighborhood. And why do I say this? It's because. Uh, he has had various roles in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and has been in particular uh, active in the Department of Security Policy at one point in his career. Right? And uh, so just to give you a, a quick uh, a summary of, of his uh, illustrious career before being appointed as Ambassador of Poland to Austria in 2008. He was Ambassador Extraordinary, and that sounds tremendous, I must say, and <laughs> potentially to the Embassy of Poland in Oslo, and that was from 2000 and 2005. Uh, before that, from 1994 to 1998, he was Minister Councillor Plenipotentiary at the Embassy of the Republic of Poland in Washington. And uh, as I've already uh, suggested, today he will be talking to us on the common security and defense policy in the EU neighborhood. And I would ask you to join me in giving him the warmest of welcome. definitions of the European Union as such, and somebody said it. European Union is uh, like an educated lady, charming but very confusing. <laughs> and uh, this is uh, even more confusing part of European Union than others. As we know, uh, the European Union was born out of war to preserve war such as uh, we saw every 50 years uh, through centuries. And to break out this uh, circle of wars, the founding fathers decided to take industries of war, coal, iron, steel, out of purely national control in favor of common management. Uh, however, as long as the NATO umbrella prevented Europe from the threat coming from the uh, Soviet Union, the European community, then European Union, 
focus mainly on economic and social development and saw no reason to build its own foreign and security policy, policy as such, uh, and uh, uh, supported, of course, by uh, its own defense system. Uh, the fundamental change occurred after the collapse of communism and uh, the end of Cold War. Uh, so in order to secure stability and external security, uh, the former members of the Warsaw Pact of Central and Eastern Europe joined NATO, which in turn had to reset its objectives by national building, peacekeeping missions and regime change interventions both in Europe, the Balkans, and out of area, for example, against them. And uh, at the same time, <coughs> the EU, uh, faced with the collapse of Yugoslavia, decided to launch common foreign and security policy. This was, this was the beginning uh, of, of, of the whole process. And it, at that time, in 1992, for the first time, it adopted so uh, so called the Petersburg uh, tasks. Petersburg, from the name of the of the place, it was it was uh, uh, declared. It was designed, and the uh, idea was to cope with the possible destabilizing of Eastern Europe. That was a very uh, narrow uh, target. 1992, the political structure. Uh, the so-called Western European Union, uh, with no standing army and depending on cooperation between its members, was given tasks ranging from humanitarian and rescue missions to peacekeeping and crisis management tasks. At the same time, within <coughs> NATO also there was an idea to enhance its European pillars that is, European members of NATO, by the creation of a, a European security and defense identity, which became an integral part of the alliance transformation. The ESDI allowed European countries to act militarily where NATO wished not to, using NATO assets if it so wished. So, in, in fact, uh, we, uh, uh, we have here the beginning of a, of a very peculiar uh, uh, situation in which some countries of Europe were members of two organizations, EU and NATO, and EU becoming uh, to be interested to build its, its uh, foreign policy and also some military component, and some countries were of Europe were members only of NATO. This, of course, produced, uh, of course, uh, not only discussions but uh, political tensions uh, within uh, within these two uh, groups uh, of countries. Uh, the important uh, development, uh, as far as the uh, common uh, security and defense policy is, is the decision of two leaders, the leaders of Great Britain and France, who in 1998 uh, uh, launched a bilateral declaration uh, which stated that, I quote, the Union must have the capacity for autonomous action backed, by, backed up by credible military force, the means to decide to use them, and the readiness to do so in order to respond to international crisis. The fact that it was the United Kingdom uh, which signed this declaration was very important because for a long time UK was very pessimistic about strengthening the European uh, military pillar being a very close ally to the United States within NATO. And then, uh, a year later, uh, a concept that is 1999, a concept of European security and defense policy was adopted. This was uh, the, the, first, the first part, the, first, uh, the beginning of, of the whole process uh, 
uh, I'm talking about, that is 1999, European Security and Defense Policy was adopted by Cologne European Council. Uh, and then the events uh, went quite rapidly. The EU made its first substantial step to enhance military capabilities when its member states signed the so-called Helsinki Headline Go, a catalog of forces uh, was created to carry out the so-called Petersburg tasks I mentioned before. However, it became clear that these objectives would not uh, be achieved quickly, and so EU defense ministers approved in 2004 Headline Go 2010, uh, extending the timelines for the EU projects. I mentioned this uh, relatively uh, uh, unimportant uh, event in the whole process just to show the constantly uh, appearing ambivalence uh, between the uh, declaration or ambition uh, political level and the uh, realist, real level, that is the substantial level, that is the implementation of in order to enable the European Union fully to assume its responsibilities for crisis management, for, for crisis management the European Council uh, in, 20, 20, in 2000 20, oh, oh, decided to establish permanent political and military structures. There are many of them, I'm not going to go through them in detail, uh, but uh, the most important where the Political and Security Committee, the European Union Military Committee, uh, Committee the Civilian Planning and Conduct Capability. So, uh, after the declaration, after the political decision, structures uh, appear. Now, in response to the developments within the EU and American concerns of a declining importance of NATO, because of course never before EU had had such a military component, so certainly NATO, mainly the United States, were concerned of, over this, as well as expectations towards uh, this European security defense policy. The comprehension framework for EU-NATO permanent relations was concluded in 2003. So finally, after a very long uh, years of discussion and consultations, some sort of partnership uh, agreement was reached between uh, and, uh, NATO and EU, which for an uh, uh, observer from outside would look a bit ridiculous because of course most of them were the same part, the same partner countries, the same uh, members. So, so uh, for example, uh, such countries as, as for example Germany or United Kingdom were in sort of, as we call it, double-headed situation. They were speaking on behalf of the EU, being also a NATO member, and speaking on behalf of NATO, being also an EU member. Um, this was, uh, at that time, not our situation, because 2003 Poland was uh, not a member of the EU, so we were uh, only a member of NATO at that time. Uh, and the EU and NATO uh, agreed um, on mutual crisis consultations arrangement geared towards an efficient and rapid decision making in each organization in the presence of a crisis. Mm, uh, there are some important uh, mechanisms and they are known uh, by uh, the name of uh, Berlin Plus arrangements. And because they very often appear in literature perhaps a few words about them. These, are, these arrangements, um, um, it is the year 2003, these arrangements cover three main elements. EU access to NATO planning, NATO European command options, and use of NATO assets and capabilities. As regards access to NATO planning, at the early stages, before EU even knows whether an operation will eventually take place. This may involve a NATO contribution to the work carried out by the EU military staff on the military strategic options. So first of all, EU was given a chance to 
uh, make a decision, uh, to, in order to make a decision to no military situation and on the option based on the assets of NATO. Second, a NATO command option for an EU-led military operations means that NATO's Deputy Supreme Allied Commander Europe is the primary candidate for EU operation commander. The remaining command elements determined by the EU may either be provided by NATO or by EU member states. So this is again a compromise. EU was given an access to, uh, to NATO planning, but the, uh, 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 the uh, uh, command option uh, was in the hands of NATO. And thirdly, the EU may request the use of NATO assets and capabilities. To this end, NATO has established a first list of its assets and capabilities that NATO would decide to make available to the EU should the EU need them. Uh, and uh, such an agreement uh, provides in particular for a possible recall of assets due to unforeseen circumstances. So, for example, if, uh, if uh, NATO has agreed to deliver uh, some assets or capabilities for an EU operation, it has the right to recall this decision uh, in the case, for example, of an attack uh, against a NATO member. That is, if the Article 5 is implied, then NATO says, well, sorry, but we'll withdraw our assets and capabilities because, here, of course, it's a theoretical construction, but, uh, but this is how it is. Uh, I, I'm trying to outline it because this is, in fact, the state of affairs today. This duality uh, of, of, uh, of procedures and decisions uh, uh, between the two. Uh, organizations. Uh, then um, came um, um, other developments. For the first time, EU approved uh, European security strategy, uh, a very controversial document uh, because uh, it is it it is impossible to translate this this uh, security strategy into operational language. However, important thing was that uh, I think for the first time in such a general way, uh, but in one document, uh, EU identified key threats Europe is faced with. And this is important. Because one could ask us the question, why, why does EU want to have any military components, any military forces? Who who against what? What are the in old uh, vocabulary enemies or enemy of the EU? So this is the key uh, threats Europe is faced with as far as this document is concerned: terrorism, proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, regional conflicts, failed states, and organized crime. As you know, it's very challenging. And of course, by regional conflicts, one might understand any conflicts of any nature. Uh, regional also is a very vague uh, description. Failed states is again a matter of a political decision. Who you consider, what country you consider to be failed. And with that followed also the establishment of other important bodies, the EU Institute security studies and European defense agents. This, the, the, the letter is much more important because it is uh, in, uh, pro in, in constant uh, progress. It supports the EU members in improving their military capabilities to complete uh, the uh, ESDP uh, targets. Uh, another development of practical relevance for crisis management was establishing EU battle groups. This was initiated by France, Germany, and the United Kingdom in 2004. Based on contributions from a coalition of member states, each such a battle group consists of approximately uh, 1,500 troops reinforced with combat support elements. 
the groups are deployable within, within uh, 15 days, with two ready for deployment at all times. And these battle <coughs> groups are again designed to deal with the Bettisburg task, particularly in conflict prevention, evacuation, aid deliverance, or initial stabilization before a larger force relieves them. France, Germany, the UK, and Spain contributed their own battle groups, while smaller member, members, uh, um, uh, smaller member countries created common groups with the lead nation. The 13 uh, battle groups reached full operation capacity in January 2007. In addition to it, uh, mention must be made about the so-called Eurocall. There is a multinational standing army call, available, course available for the EU, NATO, but also for UN and OSCE. This uh, uh, force created in 1992 had headquarters in Strasbourg, in France, and there are five countries uh, as free as framework nations. That is, those who started the whole uh, construction. And these are Belgium, France, Germany, Luxembourg, and Spain. A further seven countries pledged to contribute personal to the staff Austria, Italy, Poland, Romania, Turkey, and the USA. Eurocorps has about 1,000 uh, soldiers uh, stationed in Strasbourg, the headquarters, and uh, there's the French German brigade with 5,000 troops. Uh, which is in fact the nucleus, the core of the, of the whole force. And altogether 60,000 troops are pledged to, for deployment in the EU or NATO rapid response mission. So this is, this is a force not particularly, not only uh, used for EU missions, but uh, available, as I said, for the EU, NATO, and but also UN. Um, uh, they, however, were always, they were, they were used, uh, that is, Eurocos participated in peacekeeping mission in Bosnia and led uh, K4 in Kosovo. What is characteristic is that uh, both in 2008 and 2009, the European Parliament voted with large resolution proposing that Eurocos should become the standing army of the EU and uh, European Union government. And now we come quickly uh, uh, to Treaty of Lisbon. This is, of course, uh, a fundamental document uh, of a legal personality, and it also introduced some changes in the area of security and defense. Well, first of all, uh, it renamed the European Security and Defence Policy into Common Security and Defence Policy. One of the problems all the students have with the European status, especially the European Union, is that it's an extremely complicated linguistic exercise. Uh, so you have to be very careful, very careful with all these abbreviations. But if you go and work in Brussels, and I hope some of you will, you will be extremely uh, 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 I mean, after working there for about two or three or five years, you will speak an, another language because uh, this is a, a typical EU language, but uh, it's very well paid. <laughs> uh, so, what are the things? First of all, there is a, a matter of obligation. The member states of the European Union are obliged to provide military and civil. civil capabilities, including multinational forces, in order to implement the targets of the, of the policy. The European Defence Agency wall was expanded, and the, a new construction uh, was also launched, the so-called permanent structured cooperation between those member states which have reached a higher degree of assets and capabilities. So this is uh, sort of a gesture towards UK Germany, France, uh, which uh, now have their sort of own uh, uh, framework of, of activities within the whole common security and defense policy. 
Uh, the progressive framing, and this is a, 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 one of those beautiful EU phrases, the progressive framing of a common union defense policy is to lead to a common defense when the European Council, acting unanimously, so decides. Almost sounds like a poetic piece, but it's not poetic because poetry because it, it is one of those changes. So it means that the European Union has decided politically to form and then to reach something which the European Union has never done before, has never dreamed of doing before. Because when we look at the history, it, will, it is to some extent contrary to the founding father's uh, idea, to some extent, because we have, of course, to take into consideration changing conditions. And uh, mm, then it introduced, we are talking about free terrorism, it introduced the solidarity clause in case of a terrorist attack or natural disaster, as well as the clause of mutual, mutual help, mutual help and support in case of a military intervention. So this common security and defense policy is not only now a matter of declaration, it's a matter of obligation. Uh, and the scope of original Petersburg task was also prominent. The legal supervision and monitoring of the CSDP was made by the European Parliament. Uh, so we have now the situation that uh, uh, we have a, a, a political declaration, a program, some forces and uh, the, the, the managerial arrangements, so to say. Uh, now we know that uh, anonymous decision in the Council of the EU, meaning ministers of foreign affairs and defense, continue to instruct the EU foreign policy and CSDP matters. However, high representative for the common foreign and security policy together with the Commission can propose use of national means and the instruments of the EU. So this uh, is not only a matter of the decision of Council, but also of the High Representative. Uh, well, of course there are obvious problems. Uh, one is uh, that uh, I outlined before, that, is that some countries are members only of one organization and some are members of both. And one of those challenges comes from uh, Turkey, as you know, an extremely important member of NATO, uh, but not a member of the EU, and as Professor has said, uh, uh, a difficult, I should say, or uh, a controversial uh, candidate for the EU. Uh, why? Because there is a, a strong uh, resistance. Now it may change. Now within the EU uh, as far as the future militia of Turkey is concerned. It is not Poland, by the way, but there are some who propose the membership of Turkey. Uh, so in spite of institutional and legal progress made, I, I have just out tried to outline it, operational cooperation, because this is at the core of an independent system, operational cooperation is made difficult by Turkey, which rejects the possibility of establishing a technical agreement with Cyprus regarding the exchange of secret information, and thus Turkey refuses any other issues but operation to include Cyprus, to exclude, to exclude Cyprus from discussion between NATO and EU. This is uh, seemingly a small matter because Turkey says we do not want Cyprus to be part of Cyprus information exchange. But as we all know, secret information at the core of our defense system. Uh, so far, perhaps it will disappear and we will know everything about everyone, but so far it is, it is uh, done in such a way. So this is, this is one, of the, one of the problems it, it is with Turkey. Uh, now, we do not have, for example, a similar uh, problem uh, as far as 
membership of, of nowhere in NATO is concerned, and uh, uh, lack of that respect and in future of nowhere entering membership. But this situation is quite different between these two, because everybody would like to come nowhere in, but uh, Norwegian public somehow is very reluctant to join you for a variety of reasons. More importantly, to undertake military operation in the framework of common uh, security and defense policy, the EU lacks most of the capabilities for strategic lift, advanced communication systems, and independent command control, and intelligence facilities. Uh, of course, recently some steps have been taken to fulfill the aims of global deployability, because this is the problem. Why, we may ask, well, because the core of, of those things uh, have been uh, and are so far the part of NATO. So, uh, members uh, of NATO have, have uh, deployed these, uh, these uh, areas to NATO, and what is even more important, in some of these areas, for example, strategically, you will have one or two or three countries involved. Other countries simply do not have uh, such capabilities. Uh, so, for example, the EU defense ministers endorsed plans this March, this March, on the 22nd of March 2012, to develop air to air refueling capabilities. You know, the capabilities which have existed for years with NATO, but it is on, only now that the EU uh, tries to prepare for such a for such a uh, process, which is of course at the core of any of any uh, air operation. Uh, but here you have, uh, of course, a problem because collectively the EU spends some 200 billion on defense annually. But uh, this is about one third of what the US aid spends. Uh, the past decade has seen at least a 15% drop in EU defense budgets. And obviously, EU countries in NATO rely heavily, still rely heavily, on US technology. And it, it was shown recently in the operation in Libya uh, with the um, Americans monitoring airspace and ground movement. And gaps in the EU military were already identified, of course, in Afghanistan. In Afghanistan. The pressure for Europe to enhance its own military forces is also coming from Washington. Because, of course, uh, of, uh, of, of the situation uh, known to you, but we will come to it later on. Uh, so, uh, what let us try to, to look at it from different points of view of the whole process. Well, let us start, of course, with the U.S. perspective, because this is, this is crucial. Of course, at the beginning of this process, Americans' position was uh, rather skeptical. They said in the, in the 90s, there should be only one collective security institution in Europe, that is NATO. Uh, Modley and Albright summed it up by articulating the so called three Ds no duplication, no decoupling, no discrimination, 1998. Uh, and of course, apart from the above concerns of, of political but also military nature, Washington wanted to retain a competitive advantage in the global arm, arms export market and technological superiority. Moreover, a uh, more autonomous European defense system could complicate the EU US superiority in the intelligence industry. In recent years, however, faced with the decreasing attention given to the European theater and the pressure to cut its military budget, USA not only accepted for EU to act in a in area and out of area crises, in instances where NATO is unwilling to act, 
But USA also urged European states to pay for its own defense and update European intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance assets, without which European military capabilities are simply useless. Uh, thus, the recent strategic step back of the United States from bearing the power burden of NATO's power projection seems to be permanent. And this is the idea which, for example, uh, is uh, seen in the recent report launched uh, in London by the Centre for European Research. Uh, and according to this report, Libya was the turning point with Washington's decision to play only a supporting role in the international intervention. There has been a profound change in the U.S. stance for two reasons. Uh, first, it was U.S. threat uh, perception. As you know, threat perception is the, the, the first uh, element of any political decision. How do you assess a situation? Uh, so this was U.S. threat perception, and in this case, uh, a U.S. wariness over its European NATO partners and shifting a focus on the Asia Pacific. So, uh, in, in, in other words, in simple words, you, as interest in Europe uh, are of lesser degree, U.S. thinks that Europe can take care of itself, and the U.S. has shifted its attention to the Asia-Pacific region. So this is a political uh, part of it. And the second, of course, is the U.S. budget. Does it mean that NATO's European powers can no longer rely on U.S. armed forces? Well, if so, the military capabilities provided so far by the U.S would have to be generated by Europe in austere times to cover for the absence of U.S. forces. Interestingly, uh, uh, at the launch of this book I mentioned, and uh, I'm quoting from, uh, uh, the Norwegian Defense Minister, Aspen Bad Eidier, said, and this I think a characteristic uh, statement which shows changing uh, attitude and changing situation in Europe as far as this problem is concerned. He said, the West is not on top anymore. It's not a return of power to Asia, but a return of symmetry. We have assumed a move to new threats, and these will always remain. But now we are looking at dealing with symmetric so situation in, 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 in very uh, short terms is this. There is a less attention of USA uh, and this gives way for European Union to develop its own uh, security and defense policy and in the future to create, to have a common defense plus some uh, uh, forces uh, which uh, uh, I, I have mentioned uh, before. Uh, but NATO is still in, in Europe because, as you might notice, the uh, objectives of the U European Union uh, security and defense policy is not a prevention of a war or any global uh, war, war in meaning of of big country, of the war, not a local war, nor uh, the uh, reply, uh, response rather, sorry, response to any military threat of a, of a, of a substantial matter, that is uh, the one which uh, means an attack against, a military attack against a European, uh, a European uh, country and a European country. So this is a very uh, uh, a never before situation in, in our part of the world that 
we are creating our security and defense policy, uh, not including what we usually understand as security and defense. Uh, I will skip perhaps a chapter on uh, on, on Poland's uh, uh, attitude towards the process and Poland's involvement, because this is obvious. First, Poland was skeptical, much more pro-American. Pro the moment it became a member of the EU and the process uh, of 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 the uh, of the partnership between the EU and NATO started, of course, now. Poland is part of it and contributed to many uh, forces uh, and EU uh, uh, operations. Uh, uh, I, will, I will rather try to uh, concentrate on uh, uh, on future challenges uh, of, of, the, of the whole process. Uh, as a matter of fact, and I have to congratulate professors from this university. I have found that this modest-looking book, New Europe and New World, contain very good articles. In fact, I have never, I, I have not found here a better collection of articles on on the area I think it's common security, uh, security and defense uh, problems of EU than included in this in this uh, in this uh, uh, book. Uh, so, uh, uh, as it was a, a, a present from, from, from you, Professor, I, I really would like to thank you, because without it I wouldn't have been able to, to say what I have said. Uh, and in, in this book I, I have found a very uh, good sort of uh, summing up of these future challenges. Uh, the uh, Professor Saponti Barua identifies three main challenges. First one is to enhance coordination and coherence between different policy areas and actors to help ensure a comprehensive approach management. For, as he says, it is not always easy to achieve consensus among the member states as regards the scope and direction of policy. In other words, how to achieve consensus as to responding to a given crisis. First of all, it is a matter of assessment. Each country assesses a threat or a crisis in a different way. Uh, then, if we can accept, theoretically, sometimes it happens, that there is a crisis, as we did, for example, Chad, Sudan, uh, then how, how will we react? So diplomacy, that is mediation, or should we deploy forces? If so, in what character? Are they to be peacekeeping forces, crisis management, or a military intervention? Uh, another, so this is a, a both political and structural, and of course it's, it is, it is uh, at the core of it is the very structure of the EU, our policy. We have all to agree on it, and others. Another challenge is related to, of course, relations with NATO and the USA. One contentious issue is uh, NATO's insistence on its option of first refusal of any proposed operation, which of course invites reservations from many countries and first of all from, uh, from France. In other words, if we say we think it is a crisis and we should react, for example, we should send our uh, crisis management forces to, to uh, monitor and to resolve the situation in a particular country. But we, as, as I said, we do not have capabilities. For example, alert. Or we are not sure about the intelligence situ situation there. Because as you know, before you send any troops, you have to have very exact, very detailed intelligence map. So we go to NATO, uh, I mean, I mean, as NATO members, we go to NATO and we say, well, we, we deserve it from them. And NATO says, well, excuse me, but this is not so, 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 and we refuse to do so because 
our, our, our idea of this is different. For example, they say, this is not a crisis situation. You can go and mediate, med mediate you know, uh, have uh, some policy. So those, this is another challenge, and this is to be resolved. Uh, and of course, uh, the one which I uh, uh, alluded to many times is, of course, that of acquiring and developing further military capabilities, especially in the context of the changing dimensions of its mission and, the, uh, as, and uh, common security and defense policies emerging global scope. There are those other uh, challenges. One is the gap between uh, EU's declarations and ambition to play a role of a global actor in the international security and the present institutional framework which suggests a relatively small scale of operations. Another is of course the geographical scope of uh, common security and de defense uh, uh, policy operations. The Balkans remains an important area and recently the EU missions, as we know, have, re have been active in Africa, Chad and Somalia are still there, and it's an operation against pirates and piracy. But the EU's prospects of using its instruments in other regions are limited, are limited by considerations of the influence of Russia and the USA, not to mention some Asian countries. And what what professor has said was a very good example. Conflict in Georgia, from a political point of view, and from when you look at the declarations and our texts in the EU, but also in the UN, UN in the United Nations, required some intervention, some response. Uh, there was a very emotional, one may say. Uh, steps taken by the Polish president who invited the uh, Lithuanian president. There was a, a big uh, demonstration, a uh, uh, sort of meeting in Tbilisi. Uh, but it was a political will. Uh, it was, it was a, an exposition of political will. EU then acted, the famous mission of uh, the President Sarkozy to, to Moscow. But in fact, in, in political and military terms, Russia did win. Russia got what it wanted. Uh, and this is a very good example that there are limits to it. Uh, and uh, mind you, it is not only a matter of the EU, it's also a matter of NATO, it's not only a matter of the UN. So, uh, Georgia's conflict again showed that there are some conflicts on which everybody agrees that there should be some form of intervention, but those who can provide intervention for political reasons, that is, not, uh, not so wanting to have any confrontation with a power which could react to it, prefer to use maximum of soft policy, nothing beyond it. Uh, what, uh, what, what could be, uh, of course, uh, uh, the future of, of the whole process? I have found another uh, article uh, from which I would uh, quote because I think that this is worth considering, his idea. This is, this, this is a, a, an article by, by, an article by a very uh, recognized American think tank uh, commentator and uh, pathologist, Andrew Moravchik, uh, who says that, uh, in effect, uh, the European defense scheme should cultivate uh, what he calls civilian and quasi-military power. He says that Europe is the quiet, not soft, but quiet superpower. There are at least, and here I'm almost quoting him, there are at least five ways in which Europe can wield the influence of a peace and war as great as that of the USA. First, EU accession. Perhaps the single most powerful policy instrument for peace and security in the world today. This was also one of the questions the uh, professor uh, presented during his, during his lecture. That uh, countries such as Georgia or Moldova want to be part of EU, 
not only because of economic impact, <coughs> they will come in a longer period of time, but the very membership guarantees uh, for them peace and security. So it's a political role for the EU. Second, Europe provides more than 70% of all civilian development assistance. This is four times more than the US and is far more equitable, equitably distrib uh, distributed, often by multi-cultural uh, uh, organizations. And he says, and this is important, when the shooting stopped in Kosovo and Afghanistan, it was the Europeans who were called on to rebuild reconstruct. Third, European troops generally under multilateral auspices help keep the peace in travel spots as uh, disparate as Guatemala and uh, Eritrea. EU members and applicants contribute ten times as many peacekeeping troops as the USA. Obviously, he's comparing the role of US and Europe. Uh, Europe as a sort of aspiring uh, military uh, military power. He says, no, no, no. Other roles are much more important to uh, to Europe. And uh, number three is uh, our peacekeeping uh, role in in, uh, in in the world. And fourth, he says, monitoring by international institutions supported by Europe. Uh, this role builds the global trust that is needed to manage crises. And he uh, ends up his article by saying, Americans are not just unwilling, but also, for complex domestic, cultural, and uh, institutional reasons, apparently unable to deploy civilian power effectively. I think this is a very uh, intelligent remark. That is, the true weakness of U.S. strategy today, for without trade, aid, peacekeeping, monitoring, and legitimacy, no amount of unilateral military might can stabilize an unruly world. Rather than criticizing U.S. military power, he says, or anchoring after it, Europe would do better to invest its political and budgetary capital in a distinctive uh, complement to it. European civilian power, if wielded shrewdly and more coherently, could be an effective and credible instrument of modern European statecraft. Uh, I will, I will uh, finish with this. Uh, I am uh, sorry that uh, uh, I have not used uh, uh, this uh, high tech. My uh, minister, a younger man, would have been very angry at me because we are supposed now to be equipped uh, with all these uh, instruments. But I think that my mission was just to show you how much progress we have made and how poor we were being students of not using these uh, uh, PowerPoints. So this is just a, an education element in this that I did not use it. Uh, and with this uh, note, I do thank you for your kind invitation and uh, I hope to see you uh, in Brussels, in Warsaw, in Kiev, in Paris.